hello folks, uh, my name is Dipto Roop. Um, I'm a product designer at Flipkart and I'll be talking about how we're using generative AI, uh, uh, image-based generative AI models to basically uh, enable large-scale visualization of products, right? Uh, so here's the problem. Uh, worldwide, and not just India, what is happening is users are hesitant to buy um, large electronics or say furnitures online. And the reason primarily is because they're not able to visualize the product in their space, right? So how can we solve that problem? That, was, that is the core uh, solution that we were looking at. So augmented reality to some extent was able to solve this problem, but the solution is not scalable. The problem with augmented reality is, uh, like a lot of devices, Android devices do not support AR, right? That is the first problem. Secondly is, um, Handheld devices, mobile devices are not as stable as a head-mounted device. So aligning objects uh, is pretty difficult for users, right? And most importantly, for augmented reality to work, you need to have all the products. You need to have 3D models of all the products, right, to put it in the scene. So making those 3D models in itself is a very uh, uh, like costly affair. So the solution uh, that, that AR was providing was not uh, scalable. So these images that you see here are from Flipkart's user research team where they went on and they were trying to find out what is the reason why users are hesitant to buy these products online. So goal, uh, the goal of the experience, what we were trying to do with generative AI is we wanted to provide a seamless or frictionless way for users to visualize a given product in their space, right? And, uh, and we wanted it to be scalable again. And in terms of our target audiences, um, since Flipkart is an e-commerce company, we have uh, what we wanted to do was primarily target pin code changers, like people who have multiple pin codes. We're trying to target these audiences and also users who are browsing a lot of um, home uh, categories, right? Or furnitures, or televisions, whatever. Yes. So in terms of methodology, what we were trying to do is we were trying to use. Uh, image-based generative AI models um, uh, a technique called in-painting capability. So what is in-painting capability? In-painting capability refers to the AI model's ability to fill in missing piece of information in an image, right? So uh, this picture here that you see um, is a prompt uh, that I've put in DALI, which is uh, say a red bicycle on a hill, oil paint, big brush paint in style of Cloud Monet. So it generates this particular image. Now what I do is I erase a certain section of this particular image, and I put in another prompt saying a red house in similar style. So what uh, DALI does is it puts in a house which is uh, similar to the surrounding, right? This is in-painting capability, and the solution that we were looking at was based on the same uh, principle of uh, in-painting. Yes, so I'll uh, briefly touch upon uh, the experience here. What we did was um, we... Uh, we, uh, every product here had a trigger, right? So the trigger for, say, this particular television was this uh, try the AI room design of widget, clicking on which you would come onto a home page or, say, uh, uh, onboarding page, which would have a multimedia widget, uh, say, a video playing and explaining the user what the feature is about. Uh, then we have a flow to capture image, and then we have centralized tabs. So the centralized tabs would contain uh, templates for the users to play with, and also say whatever progress you're making with the images that they've uploaded, those would get uh, saved here, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you, again, capturing the room, we wanted the user to click a picture of their room. And when they would do that, uh, it was extremely important to call out the privacy disclaimer. Because as soon as you're using information uh, that the users are uh, uh, giving the platform, it's important to call out that we'll be storing these images for future references or uh, whether we'll be using to enhance their experience. So you should have these ethical considerations in place, especially if you're using uh, AI. Uh, and then when the users would click on, uh, say, the camera, when they're using the camera, we're giving them a one-is-to-one -one camera viewport and not, say, the entire screen. The primary, uh, the primary reason why we were doing this is because um, for this particular pilot, we were using stable diffusion, which is, again, a generative model. 
uh, image with generative AI model, and it function the default size for uh, uh, say uh, stable diffusion is 512 into 512 pixel, which is uh, one is to one aspect ratio, right? So we wanted to make the input similar to the output, so that the uh, so that the output has very little distortion. Because if, as soon as your image is, uh, your aspect ratio is different to the output, it will create a distortion. So to avoid that, uh, we were using one is to one uh, camera viewport. And then we would also have uh, the help text here guiding the user about what to do, uh, how to click the best possible picture. Uh, then comes the room selection. So again, what we were doing is, as soon as the user uh, clicks an image, the next step is we, would, we were asking them to associate that picture with the room. So what that does is, uh, as soon as you map an image to a room in the back end, the room could load up uh, possible verticals that that image is associated to, right? So if you're clicking a picture of, say, uh, uh, you've just clicked a picture and you've uh, said that it's a picture of a living room. So in the back end, we would be knowing that possible furnitures or, say, uh, electronics that can come up in a living room would be, uh, say, a TV unit, a television, or a sofa. So the load time or the computing time would immensely reduce in that case. So that's, again, a tech consideration here. Um, and then we would mask. So remember in the methodology slide, we were showing we're using the in-painting capability, wherein in an image, we were uh, removing a certain section. Uh, so similar use case here, what we were doing is, instead of erasing that section, we are giving the user physical mask. Uh, this blue object here is a physical mask here. What we are trying, asking them to do is mask the area that you would want to erase out, right? So the user masks that area, and what uh, that does is, as opposed to erasing a section, having a physical mask enables you to have a control of the aspect ratio. Again, if you say, for instance, you click a picture of a, a TV unit which doesn't have a television on it, and you want to visualize how, how a television would uh, up, look like uh, when it's there, right? So if you give user the freedom to erase, what they'll do is they'll end up erasing the entire wall behind it, right? And that would create a problem. That, uh, say a 42-inch television would become a large-scale theater-size uh, uh, screen. So we didn't want to do that. So we wanted to restrict that. Hence, we gave a uh, physical masking. And the other thing that we were doing is we were trying to uh, allow them to uh, allow our uh, models to be optimized by resolution. So rather than rendering the complete area on an image, we were just allowing them to render a single portion. What that does is it helps immensely reduce the compute time. Because each time you make an API call, it takes five to six seconds to load that particular section. So again, we were trying to optimize by resolution and then scaling the selection. So we, we gave the user a slider to scale in uh, uh, the particular mask. And now what is happening is, if you see, uh, not just wait. Uh, when the user clicks the image and they click on Place TV with AI Magic, the in painting capability kicks in and it replaces that section with the television, say that is on Flipkart. Right? So users are now able to visualize the particular uh, section. Yes. So once the user uh, goes through the masking flow, they come onto this piece of. Uh, we can say, call it a dashboard. It's not essentially a dashboard, but a section. And uh, this particular page, what it does is, uh, through on this page, via this page, you create, uh, you, uh, you get to visualize other products, more products. If you want, you can edit uh, the particular product out again. So this is the anatomy for that. Again, we have the one is to one image area, which I mentioned earlier. And there's a status bar, there are actions, and there's an input and feedback panel here, right? Uh, yeah, so essentially that translates into uh, the, the features that we want the, uh, the user to have here. Uh, now we have provision for choices. So uh, how many of you here have used uh, tools like Midjourney or Stable Diffusion? A lot, or a lot of you, right? So as soon as you hit a prompt, you would see uh, uh, like four variants of the same image appearing. Uh, same, uh, like your output has four variants of it, right? So similarly, uh, these uh, image generating models, what it does is, it can generate multiple outputs, right? And to keep that in consideration, we gave the users a slider for uh, horizontally scrolling the possible variants that can come out of a particular mask. So ideally, it shouldn't happen. Uh, only a single image should come out. But as you know, the technology is pretty new. And uh, 
it can so happen that the picture you've clicked has uh, some sort of uh, distortion. It could be in, in the form of lighting, uh, lighting. It could be because of the perspective or the angle. So th these image generating models which are being trained, uh, they might not be able to perceive it correctly at the first go. So that training needs to happen uh, co uh, constantly. So anyway, we had a provision for choices. Choices are nothing but the variance. Right? And then we also gave the users to give feedback on these particular choices. So it, initially, when, you, uh, when these, uh, data, uh, the models are being trained on data sets, uh, we don't know uh, as to uh, with which selection the user would like more. Right? So uh, we gave users an option to upvote or downvote the particular uh, uh, save, uh, choice that they would like. So you, the users would, would downvote that, uh, upvote or downvote it. And what this does is it helps us train the models better. Uh, then we gave the user to visualize before and after. So before would look like this, and after would look something like this. And it, it was a very immersive action that we gave. As soon as the user hits on before and after visualization uh, tab, we uh, sort of give prominence to that and uh, dim the other sections. right? And we also have an edit mask flow there. So if the users feel they've not edited out that particular area well, they can always edit it again. Uh, then we have the view details and uh, visualize more products. I think uh, since it's lightning talk, I might not be able to complete it in time. So I don't want to get into details of this. Uh, again, uh, so models in the sense, while you're saving a room, it is very important to again give a disclaimer that how you would be using the data. Uh, it is a, a very important ethical consideration, Simon, again, that you tell the user what you will be doing with that particular data. Uh, and then when the room is saved, in that initial onboarding page that I told, uh, spoke about, the, what happens is the room gets saved in, in the save room section of that onboarding page, and the users can come again later and modify it if they wish to. That brings me into the user experience part of it. Now I'll uh, talk about the generative AI landscape in general. So primarily, there are these uh, three areas that are there. One is text and code, the other is image and video, and then we have audio. So text and code, I think uh, there are company, uh, you might be knowing about uh, ChatGPT. Uh, and then uh, there are these uh, code building tools that are there. And we have also there's next gen assistant for superior customer understanding that is uh, happening. So Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, Code Here, Hugging Face, these are the leading companies in text and code space. Then we have the image and video. So our entire experience that I was talking about falls under image and video section. And uh, uh, there are companies like uh, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, Runaway, uh, these companies, and uh, DALI as well. So these are the companies that are leading the image and video space. And then there's the audio space. Audio space is extremely um, important um, and popular at this point of time. So if you would have, uh, and, and the, sorry, and the arrow that you see here at the bottom talks about the adoption and maturity at, uh, at this point. So text and code has the highest adoption and maturity at this point. Image and video has medium, and audio has low. If you would have asked me if I had to present this a month back, I would uh, rate audio as a low adoption or maturity. But uh, currently, like at this given point in time, audio has also gained medium maturity and adoption. You might be seeing memes uh, wherein Cristiano Ronaldo is singing Bollywood songs or say uh, uh, some, uh, uh, the voice of a deceased singer is being used to play a new song, uh, a uh, new age song, right? So audio in itself has uh, gained a lot of popularity. Uh, I would have played something here, but I don't think we have uh, internet connection over here. Not able to play it, but yeah. That's about it. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you can reach out to me over LinkedIn. This is my email ID. If you want, you can scan the code. You can directly hit me up on LinkedIn. So yeah, thank you so much. I don't think we have time for questions, but I'll be here. Uh, if you have anything to ask, uh, just hit up. Thank you. <laughs>